All right, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. I wanna welcome everybody today, wherever you're coming from, whether it's here in the US or outside, to our first of what we hope to be many um, in a series to honor and in the memory of Lucy Cherbis on tissue culture work. Um, we're bringing this to you from the Drosophila Genomics Resource Center here in Indiana University, Department of Biology. And I just wanna give a quick background to the DGRC. I think most of you are familiar with us, but um, just to give you a little perspective in history and, and just to highlight a little bit of Lucy's role initially in the creation of the DGRC. We are now um, nearly 20, we are 20 years old. We started in 2003. Um, the idea was to create a resource center that um, complemented the BDSC. BDSC of course has the fly stocks and there was a growing need in the community to have um, molecular and cellular resources for Drosophila researchers. And so our goal was to collect and distribute DNA clones and vectors, tissue culture lines. Lucy had already been doing this for years. Um, and then we also had an arm um, that focused on microarrays. And then there was a third, a fourth uh, part of the resource center that was uh, looking at developing and testing genomic technologies for Drosophila. This was all NIH funded under the PIs of Dr. Justin Andrews, Peter Churbis, and Tom Kaufman. And in those early years, the three main parts of the DGRC, the clones and vectors, the cell lines and the microarrays were started by myself, Lucy Cherbis and Justin Andrews. I was in charge of the clones and vectors and we estimated at the time we'd have maybe 100 to 200 vectors and around 10,000 cDNAs. Lucy anticipated maybe getting up to 100 tissue culture lines. She had maybe 20 here at the time. Um, and that kind of really was a naive, uh, perspective on our part, because now 20 years later, um, under the direction of Andy Zellhoff, um, we have over 400 vectors, actually over 500 vectors now, or 600, a million clones. Um, Arthur has taken over Lucy's position, and we now have over 300 cell lines, and Daniel is in charge of research and uh, acquiring new vectors and cell lines. We've really grown um, substantially in the last 20 years, way beyond what Lucy and I ever visioned would happen. Uh, when Lucy retired, um, she still kept in touch and still answered some questions from time to time. Um, and then many of you know, she had uh, battled cancer for many years um, and she passed away last year. And in her passing, um, one of the things that uh, we thought would be really nice is to find some way to honor her. And so creating this uh, seminar series that focuses on the tissue culture lines was the way we found uh, to do this for her. Um, she was extremely passionate about tissue culture lines. I knew her as a graduate student. Um, I worked alongside her and she mentored me as a postdoc in tissue culture cells. And then I had the honor of being a colleague with her in the DGRC. Um, she has an had an amazing um, handle on, on all of the lines that we had and uh, was really pivotal in, in making these lines become very useful to the, the Drosophila community. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Arthur. He is going to give a little bit more background on Lucy's work and um, that will lead into Mandy's talk. So we wanna thank you guys for joining us today and Arthur, I'm gonna stop my screen and you can take it over. All right, so uh, good morning, evening, and night for some of you there. Um, my name is Arthur Luha, one of the associate directors here at the DGRC. And I'm not gonna talk so much about Lucy's work, but um, I wanna feed that into uh, introducing Mandy, our speaker today. So um, I'm here to introduce Professor Emerita Amanda Simcox as our first speaker of the Lucy Chirpers Lecture Series. Um, Mandy received her bachelor's and doctoral degrees from the University of Sussex in the UK. And her first foray into the software cell culture was during her graduate days with Professor Jimmy Sang, a pioneer who designed the Shields and Sang and Free Media, which is still very widely used today. Um, Mandy made her first cell lines from a Newton line in the Sang lab, and she went on to a postdoctoral position with 
uh, Professor Ellen Shen at Johns Hopkins University, where she continued to make hundreds more uh, Newton lines using the classical methods. Uh, and then Mandy started her lab at OSU, where she progressed up the ranks. There, she continued to come up with more effective methods for making new cell lines. Um, her most recent work produced a set of uh, lineage-specific cell lines. So Mandy loved sharing her science, and we are very honored today to have her share her insights with us. And I, one thing that um, if we think about how Lucy's work intersected with Mandy's work, uh, one part is when I was a graduate student here, and what happened was that I saw a whole bunch of development of the cell lines that has got the FP insertion lines, the ducking sites lines. So uh, Lucy here at the DGRC created a whole set of cell lines with the FP docking sites. And on the other side, Mandy's also created RAS lines that has got the FP uh, sites as well. So um, with this, I welcome Mandy to speak to us on uh, the science and art of the software cell culture. So please, Mandy. Great. Thank you so much, Arthur. Well, it's really quite a pleasure to see everyone who's joining this. It feels like a friend meetup. So I'm delighted to, to see so many people that I know on this talk. It's absolutely my privilege to be able to honour Lucy through being part of this lecture series and present um, some recent um, past work that we've been doing. So let me go to my next slide. And this is really just to put it in context. So HeLa cells were the first immortal cell lines. This particular cell line is very famous. It took on a life of its own in science and in society. So the HeLa cells in terms of the science have been really important in molecular and cell biology. They've been developing the polio vaccines are very famous for the science and also within society and the issues about, so these obviously were derived from a patient, what ownership patients have over their tissues and any profits that might result from that. So an indication of just how well used these cells are, if you, sell, if you search PubMed with the term healer, you get over 120,000 results. That was in, they started in the year 1953 in terms of the fly cell lines, which I illustrated with the early days in Drosophila. This is starting about 10 years later. So I put the major players up in those early days on this slide, and I want to highlight a few things. So you probably, those of you who use tissue culture cells in your research will probably recognize KC and the even more famous S2 cells. So Guy Echalier derived the KC cells. He's also edited two really important editions of books called Drosophila Cells in Culture. Imogen Schneider derived the S2 cells. I took this picture of them from the DGRC website. A lot of you work with those potentially in your lab. So that's a picture of them. Also pictured here near and dear to my heart is Jimmy Sang. So Jimmy Sang, as Arthur mentioned, was my thesis advisor. And he was very um, well known for his work on primary cultures where he described the various cell types that grew in vitro. Here are two pictures of Lucy. I really like these pictures. It's taken from 1979, and thanks to Peter for, the, for these pictures, from um, 1979. And Lucy, pictured here, is at a conference at a place called Riggi Kaltberg, which is a resort in the Swiss Alps. You see Lucy pictured with Imogene Schneider and also with my old boss, Jimmy Sang. What one of the things I really like about this is the extraordinary number of wine glasses on the table. And you see someone here opening yet another bottle of wine, it looks like. Also, though, pictured here are two other bottles, and these bottles contain insect cell medium. So both Imogen Schneider and Jimmy Sang are famous for the formulations of insect medium that people use in their labs today, Schneider's medium and Shields and Sang M3 medium. Just to cast your mind back to the old days, I remember having to go and weigh out all the constituents of M3 medium. So let me tell you, I'm very lucky that this is commercially available now. Lucy has made incredible um, efforts in research, 
accomplishments. And this is just a sampling of Cherbus papers. So the Cherbus, Peter and Lucy have been pioneers in using cells as models for understanding biology. Here's a sampling of their papers. These are really important papers and very highly cited. So Lucy has an extraordinary research record. Lucy and Peter have also been very um, involved in community resources. I was lucky enough to be at the fly meeting when they gave everybody a free copy of genome research because it was packed full of articles on mode and code in the fly genome. If you take my copy, and this is it sitting on my desk and let it open, it naturally opens to this paper. And this is the paper by Lucy and Peter and others on the transcriptional diversity of 25 cell lines. And that's a really important reference for the community. As Arthur alluded, Lucy was also involved in technology. And this was our opportunity to go head to head with the Cherbus group and develop a method which you'll be familiar with for recombination mediated cassette exchange, which has been used in flies a lot using the PyC31 transposase. We wanted to make a version of this to be used in cell culture, which involved incorporating an AP, which is the landing site in the cells. So we took very different approaches. We'll see, as you'll see in the rest of my talk, we started with engineering flies for all the properties that we wanted, whereas Lucy started with the cells and then engineered in the AP site. This, the advantage of this is it allows you to insert a single transgene that can be very important for structure function kinds of analyses. And this is just a picture of some of the cells that we made expressing alpha tubulin. And I can say, as you all, any of you who know Lucy, it was actually an absolute pleasure to coordinate and publish back-to-back -back papers in genetics. So most of my talk, I'm going to describe the RAS method for cell line generation in Drosophila. This is just a quick cartoon and I'll refer to parts of it, but the main, thing to understand about this method is that expressing an activated form of RAS, RAS B12, in tissue culture cells gives them both the growth and survival advantage, and that lends itself to the rapid generation of cell lines in vitro. So that's sort of a key point about why RAS is being used. In mammalian systems very early on, and in comparison with mammalian tissue culture, Drosophila tissue culture is somewhat in its infancy. So for many years in mammalian systems, genetic methods were used to derive cell lines and involving oncogenes and tumor suppressors. And work in vivo in flies shows clearly that these genes have an analogous um, function. So this is a warts clone growing on the head of this fly, and you can see there's a massive overproliferation. So what we wanted to do is to check whether in vitro cells would also be given a growth advantage by looking at the effects of oncogenes and tumor suppressors. We surveyed a lot of them, and we found that these are the best. So activating the RAS oncogene or repressing tumor suppressor in the warts or HIPPO pathway or P10 were the most effective. But probably the easiest to work with and very effective is the RAS oncogene. And that's what I'm going to tell you about. So this is a cartoon version of it. We use the Brand and Perimon GAL4 UAS system to express RAS. So here are the two flies used in this system. As you can imagine, overexpression of RAS would be organism lethal. So we bring them together in a cross. So in this case, GAL4 has been expressed in all cells using the ACT5C enhancer. And then here's the RAS gene as the UAS target gene. So in this egg, every cell in the embryo is expressing the RAS gene under the influence of GAL4, which binds and turns it on. Every single cell in this embryo expresses RAS. So what you do with those embryos, and this just shows you the cross here, is cross the flies together, collect the embryos, homogenize them, plate them in a primary culture, 
And then really in quite a short period of time, these cells have reached passage 10 and can be considered immortal. So it accelerates the generation of cell lines. These are views of primary cultures or early cultures showing you the dramatic effect of RAS expression. This is a control culture at about one month. And you can see there's some, a patch here of proliferating cells. And if you're patient and you set up enough of them, you can wait for spontaneous changes and less than or the best about 10% of these primary cultures will become cell lines, but it's a spontaneous process and it's often very protracted. Within a month, a RAS expressing culture has already been passaged. So what you're looking at is the first passage of a primary culture and you can see there are tons of proliferating cells in this early passage. All the undergrads in the lab, for everyone in the lab, has used this method to set up cell lines. If you set up 10 good primary cultures, 100% of those will progress to cell lines. So it's a very robust method. I've told you that it's fast. I've told you that it's robust. I've hinted at the fact that in those spontaneous lines, there are unknown genetic changes, whereas we know that the proliferation advantage is being conferred by activated RAS, so we understand the genetics. I also want to illustrate here how we and others have used this system to rapidly create mutant cell lines. So this is about generation of cell lines from the Rumi mutant. Rumi is a mutation in the notch in a notch pathway gene. In this cross, so you'll be familiar here, this is bringing RAS and actin together. And here they are. So this embryo is expressing RAS. It's also homozygous for the Rumi mutation. So you'd set up primary cultures, derive lines, and then they're examined down here by Western blotting. And you can see two of these Rumi mutant cell lines don't express the Rumi protein, whereas the control does. So very rapidly, you can derive pure lines of mutants of your choice set up in the genetics of the flies. What I'm gonna focus on mainly is our second generation of the RAS method. So actin gel four is very effective, but you don't know what the lineage of the cells in a given line are. So in this next generation, we're using now lineage specific expression of RAS to derive cell lines of different lineages. And I'm gonna show you fly muscle and other tissues essentially growing in a dish. Arthur said that when I was in Jimmy Sang's lab, that's when I made my first cell line, perfectly true, but I was actually a developmental biologist, strictly really at that time. And this is the stage embryo that I worked with. This is a scanning EM of an early gastrula embryo. And what I did for my thesis work is transplant cells from one end of one embryo to the other end of another embryo. So we know from that and lots of fate mapping and other kinds of work that even though these cells look very homogeneous, they are fated to particular types. And I'm going to color code that here. So this blue patch up here are the cells in the embryo that are going to go on to form the epidermis. These cells will become the nervous system, these purple ones. And down here, keep an eye on these ones. These pink ones will become the mesoderm. So I've drawn a muscle cell. So when this embryo grows up into a fly, its nervous system represented by the brain here would be one lineage. Here are the muscles of the thorax and then the outside of its body co color coded in blue to represent the epidermis. So I'm gonna focus in here on these pink cells. In mammalian systems, even mice are big enough that you can dissect them, you can take an organ or a tissue of your choosing and then derive a cell line from it. You will know that flies are really tiny and it would be very difficult to do it that way, not practical. But using the GAL4 UAS system, we can essentially do a genetic dissection and target rats into a lineage of our choosing. So I show this with the example of the mesoderm. So I'm still using that pink color coding. So in this case, the GAL4 gene 
is only expressed in mesoderm cells under the control of this 24B enhancer. So what that means is that this cell down here, again, color-coded pink, that will become mesoderm, GAL4 is turned on and RAS is expressed. So these mesoderm cells are expressing RAS, whereas this other cell over here, which is destined to be the epidermis, RAS is not expressed. So that's the basis of the genetic dissection. This is what it looks like still in cartoon version, but to show you how it then works, here's, this represents an embryo with the different cells, the different lineages. These would be dissociated, plated in a primary culture. And then as time goes on, because RAS gives mesodermal cells both a growth and a survival advantage, you start to see more pink cells. And if you follow them further through time, there's now a pure culture of muscle progenitor cells. In Drosophila development, there are different landmark stages that are regulated by the maturation hormone ectisone, so the larval body form metamorphoses into the adult body form under the influence of the hormone ectisone. What we wanted to do is try and recapitulate this in vitro by taking those progenitor cells and giving them, in fact, two doses of hormone and seeing whether they would mature into muscle cells. These are pictures of what they look like, plus and minus the hormone. These are the progenitor cells, the growing cells. They look very sort of bland. They're just these bipolar cells. Under the influence of ectisone, however, they stop proliferating and they change radically in morphology. It's a little bit easier to see here. So these are the cells that are differentiated. They show muscle morphology and also marker expression. So this very beautiful picture made by Shane in the lab shows one of these in the middle here, one of these muscle cells. You can see it's actually a fusion of two cells because there are two nuclei stained with DAPI and the cell and all the cells in this field are expressing myosin heavy chain, which would be a marker of mature muscle. And then maybe even more excitingly, these cells actually spontaneously contract in culture. I can honestly say it was one of the most exciting days of my scientific life when we looked down the microscope and saw these cells moving. So they're going through the whole of muscle development in a dish under the influence of the hormone, and they're doing all the things that muscle cells in vivo would do, differentiating and becoming active. So what we also wanted to know is whether we could make cells from other lineages, and this is a paper that we published quite recently with our colleagues at DGRC and also colleagues at Harvard University. So I'm gonna go through this paper, not like a journal club, but sort of using it almost like product sheets to tell you a little bit about these different cell lines, their characteristics, and then also some red letter text for protocol hints, because my understanding of this lecture series is to learn more about how to do tissue culture in your own lab. This is what they look like. I actually really like this figure from the paper because you can see that these cells from different lineages, glial, epithelial, muscle, actually look different morphologically. The glial cells are sort of long and spindly looking. The epithelial cells make this rather beautiful squamous epithelium. The muscle cells and these neuronal-like cells are a bit sort of more ordinary than these sort of bipolar cells. Down at the bottom here, you see the famous hemocyte derived line as two cells floating in suspension. We also derived a hemocyte cell line. Unlike S2 cells, though, our hemocyte line cells grow in these clusters, in these floating clusters in the dish. All right, so a little more on the different lineages. So these are the ones I've already shown you. They were generated by expression of RAS with 24B. And it allows me to make my first point that if you're thinking about doing this in your lab, choosing a GAL4 driver requires empirical testing because the obvious GAL4 line to produce a muscle cell line 
that we tried first was mef 2 gal 4 So this is a master regulator of the muscle lineage, but it did not, for reasons unknown to us, allow us to derive any continuous cell line. So plan on testing a number of different drivers for a given lineage. I showed you that the B8 cells, they were the ones in the movie that they contract. These are the RNA-seq data um, can, um, generated by our colleagues at DGRC and analyzed at Harvard. And what they show on this small section of that data are differentially expressed genes that are master regulators of various lineages. So this active muscle cell line expresses twist and nautilus, which you might expect for an authentic mesodermal cell. But it also illustrates another point. So this is another clone from the muscle lineage. You don't see expression of those cells. And these cells lost their ability to differentiate into active muscle. Cells change with extended passaging. So it's good husbandry to keep frozen aliquots at early passages and then return to those as you do their experiments. I describe work where both Lucy, the Chervis group, and our group have engineered at P landing sites. So this um, cell line has an at P site, so you could use RMCE to insert a transgene of interest. These are cells of the glial lineage der derived from RepoGal4. So Repo is a master regulator of glial cells, and um, we generated one line, one line only, and then we cloned it. And this again is the data for the, and you can see that two of the clones, so you have three clones from this parental line, two of them express glial cells missing two, which is a master regulator of glial differentiation. This was the work of Molly Josephoff, who was an undergraduate in the lab and a very determined person because she set up 45 primary cultures, but we had a very low success rate. We only have one line that has continued and showing, for example, expression of repo, which you expect for glial cells. Molly tried to modulate RAS expression, for example, co-expression of the gal um, repressor, and also inactivating tumor suppressors, but it appeared not to change the success. It so happens that this one line that we have does express, uh, does downregulate the tumor suppressor of GRAP, but the role of that, if any, in the generation of this cell line is obviously unknown because we have one example. These are epithelial cells. They're derived from expressing RAS with the BTL, GAL4 driver, so BTL is expressed in tracheal epithelium. You can see the cells here, and at their surface, they're expressing the marker of epithelium E cadherent. So you can see they're forming this sheet and expressing this marker gene at the surface. In contrast, S2 cells show just diffuse expression of E cadherent throughout the um, cytoplasm. Tracheolus is a master regulator of um, tracheal development. And you, you can see that the line that I show you here, BTL3, expresses that gene. But it also allows me to bring to your attention that these cells sometimes can express unexpected genes. These are cells growing in culture. They're not an exact match. They're EVO in vivo counterparts. So this this um, line actually expresses a gene that you would be more characteristic of the mesoderm. Luckily, you have these data. These are all available um, to, to look. So if you choose to work on a particular line, you can see its gene expression profile. The neuronal-like line is actually different. So again, we went in thinking LV and another panneural GAL4 would be the ideal driver to produce neuronal lineage cells, but we didn't derive any lines from that. But we knew the broad expression of, of RAS with something like actin 5 c did produce all different kinds of cells in the cultures. So we actually cloned, use single cell cloning, so a clonal derivative of broad expression, and then we've classified it as neuronal 
based on its expression pattern in RNA-seq and also on morphological data. And I show you some of that here. And this is um, staining the cells with 22C10, which recognizes the Foots gene. And you can see even in this undifferentiated sample, some pretty neuronal looking like cells. When you add ecdysone to these cells, you can see a, an upregulation and reaction with 22C10. And I hope you can see that more of these cells are putting out these dendritic looking processes. Something else about this line is that RAS expression is actually regulatable. So this is a gene switch GAL4, and it's only active. So RAS is only switched on when RU48 is um, present in the medium. We hoped and we thought that if you use this kind of a system and you switch RAS off, the cells might then differentiate. So you're going to block proliferation and encourage differentiation. Turns out, in fact, that was not the case. And the way to get these cells to differentiate is to use the differentiation hormone ecdysone. This is the last one that I'm going to show you. And I should say that neuronal one and this one too were generated by Nikki in the lab. This also is a clonal derivative of broad RAS expression, and it's blood cell type based on expression data. It's an extremely strong match to single cell RNA-seq data from hemocytes. It too has a regulatable version of RAS, so a gene switch driver. And you can see over here on this growth curve that in the presence of the inducer, the cells grow, and if you turn RAS off, they remain quiescent. I think these are very beautiful cells. They grow in these clusters suspended. This is an early culture. As time goes on, these clusters get bigger and bigger, and they make these big rafts of floating cells. Perhaps these are like the sessile clusters of hemocytes that are seen in larvae. So that was the end of my set of product sheets. So what's next? We hope these cells will be very useful in both low and high thr throughput analyses that the community will conduct. We think they'll be very useful for cell biology because you can have cells in culture, you can do very precise manipulation and very clear imaging. We also think high throughput will be important in these cells. Genetic screens, so if you remember, we've engineered many of them with an AP site, so that might help doing RNAi or CRISPR screens and compound screens. And what we think will be different about these screens is that now you can conduct them in a much more physiological context in a relevant cell type. Because you can produce large numbers of homogeneous cells, they should be useful for biochemistry. We hope that the method itself will encourage others to generate lines from other cell types of their interest. So we hope that the number of these lineage-specific cell lines will increase. You can put together two of the things I talked about today, the second generation RAS, where you can derive a particular cell type, and then you can also make that cell type mutant for a disease gene of interest. So creating disease models in the relevant cell type. I'm going to finish here with just a couple of things. So in the Simcox lab, we're thinking about these cells, which I'm sure you have not, as fly burgers and also to study cancer biology. So complete diversion here. There are a lot of people to feed. The population is projected to be about 10 billion in 2057. It's numbers from the United Nations. And when I check today, the world population is currently over 8 billion. So my question is, could lab-based protein solve the demand while avoiding harm to animals and having a lower ecological footprint? It takes a lot of meat to feed the world. 350 million tons, and a ton is 2,000 pounds, are consumed globally every year. I had chickens when I was growing up in the English countryside, so I love chickens, but I think it's a bit unnerving that there are three chickens for every person on earth. If you weigh all the livestock, it outweighs wild birds and mammals by a factor of 10. And the average American eats a staggering 273 pounds of meat a year. 
these that I think are fascinating statistics come from this website called The World Counts. So could cell-based meat provide enough sustenance as we increase in cell number on the earth? Could it cause less harm to animals? Would it have a better ecological footprint? You may have heard more about lab-based meat in the news recently because the FDA just approved the first chicken product that can be sold to consumers. So a company called Upside Foods is one of the leaders in this market. And you can actually go to a few restaurants in, in the US and buy one of their lab-based chicken dishes. The very first, and this cartoon shows the the burger being generated in a dish here and eaten here. The very first cell-based burger cost $280,000. So clearly costs have come down a lot since then and will have to come down a lot before you're gonna to go to your supermarket and buy it. While this may not seem terribly appetizing in US culture, insects are in part of the diet of about 2 billion people in the world. And that's a lot of people. I've shown you the first example of invertebrate cultured mussel. We wonder if there's a niche in this market for fly burgers. We think that growing insect meat has the advantages of a simple pipeline and a low cost. It's easy to grow insect cells. They don't need incubators. They don't need CO2. So it might actually be a cost effective product. Stay tuned. And now I want to highlight how we're using a RAS model to study tumor dormancy. So tumor dormancy is a huge problem. Cells leave the primary tumor, sometimes even before it's been detected, and they lie dormant at distant sites. This is often the bone marrow. They can remain there for years and even decades. But if some signal or change in the local environment reactivates those dormant cells, this underlies metastatic relapse and the regrowth of the tumor at distant sites. They're not doing nothing while they're dormant. They have characteristic signaling signatures and gene expression patterns. So what we need is new models so that we can identify these specific pathways target those pathways and then specifically kill dormant cells. We hope that the gene switch RAS cells might be such a model. So I'm going to show you that first in this cartoon. So these are the gene switch RAS cells. So remember that these cells are RAS is only expressed in this case when the flies eat the drug RU486. The um, tumor cells are also expressing under the same control GFP, so they glow green. This is two flies that were injected with tumor cells on the same day. The fly, the female fly at the top, is the cells have been kept dormant for 17 days because the fly was fed ordinary food. The fly down here, the cells were kept dormant for eight days, and then the the fly was transferred onto food with RU486 to reactivate RAS. And nine days later, I think you can see in this fly that's glowing green all the way down to its head, these dormant tumor cells have been reactivated and this fly will shortly succumb due to the tumor version. So we hope this model might be important for discovering how we could target cells while they're dormant. My title said it would also involve the art of Drosophila cell culture. And I've taken here just a paragraph from Imogene Schneider's paper describing the generation of the S2 cell lines. And what um, Imogene Schneider is saying in this paragraph is that you should know your cells, you should understand how they grow and how to look after them. Choosing the appropriate time to attempt subculturing was necessarily subjective. You've got to figure it out. Um, not surprisingly, the successful reading of such criteria was considerably enhanced by experience in handling the cultures. Get to know yourselves. This is some um, that you've seen before, showing these different morphologies. The point I'm making with this slide is that over time, these cells reach quite high confluent density. So they're looking very different now at the end of a passage. 
these S2 cells, and here they are, this is a complement culture, they're incredibly hard to kill. You, you know that probably from your own experience. However, with these cells, which you have to use trypsin for because they're adherent, so you use trypsin when you passage these cells, when you dislodge these cells and then seed them into a new culture. And the number one and the number two way to kill off cells is either to passage them too soon or passage them too late. So you must learn from experience and probably reading our paper because we have all of those pictures and we talk about confluent densities, how to look after these cells. So let me finish by thanking everybody, the people in my lab whose names I put up, Shiva who derived a lot of these cell lines, Shane's been working on the muscle cells, Nikki derived the neuronal and the blood cell line, Molly derived the glial cell line, Jack and Shane have been working on the tumor cell project. And then for the next gen RAS method, our colleagues at Harvard, Norbert Perrimon, Stephanie Moore, Claire Hu, Wei Hang Chen, and then your own at the DGRC, Andy, Arthur, and Daniel. And let me do a special call out at the bottom here to Alan Chern. I haven't looked who's here, but Alan said he might be. And it was in Alan Chern's lab, as Arthur mentioned, that I first did my real foray into cell culture, and I made a ton of cell lines from temperature-sensitive mutants. So thank you, Alan, for getting me started on this. And then let me finish, of course, by showing you another picture of Lucy. You actually saw this um, in Chris's talk. I really like this picture of Lucy. It reminds me of how wonderful it was to see Lucy at fly meetings. I would always seek Lucy out because she was the absolute authority from all, on all things Drosophila cell culture. So thank you very much, Lucy, for your contributions to cell culture. You will be sorely missed. And thank all, thanks to all of you for your kind attention. All right, um, let's thank Mandy one more time just for sharing her generous insights with all of us uh, today. Um, so the floor is open for Q&A. You can put in your chat, uh, question in the chat, or if you raise your hand, you can also ask directly if you'd like to. Uh, so yes, I see Brian, right, right uh, raising his hand. Brian, please. Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you oh. for sharing, and I can't think of a better first talk to honor Lucy. Um, Thank you, Brian. Yes. So I, my question is about heterogeneity within a culture. Yes. Um, both expression and like genomic heterogeneity, like gene in, genome instability. And I'm thinking of it not just as maybe a challenge if you want homogeneous cells in culture, but to what extent it models genetic heterogeneity of tumors in vivo when you inject into flies. So yeah. can you feel like the heterogeneity of expression or yeah. genome within a culture? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I, I think that's a very valid point and it's one that we have not looked at. The cell lines that we've derived, they're clonal derivatives, so they're single cells, but then of course they grow and change. If you look, for example, at karyotypes, and I know that's a very crude indicator, but if you look at the karyotypes of, say, three clones from the same parental cell line, they have the same karyotype. And I think that implies that there's very strong selection, and probably even the parental cell lines are actually clonal, but of course there's going, going to be variation. But we haven't looked, for example, at a clone over time to see what, what changes, but absolutely expect that those would occur. We have not looked at it systematically. I think it's an interesting question in terms of tumor dormancy, for example. We have grown those cells dormant, I grew them myself actually, for like three weeks. I mean, they'll sit in the dish for a really long time, and then you spontaneously see colonies of growing cells. So they've acquired ways to get around the block in RAS and to escape dormancy. So it could actually be a very good model for that. Yeah, partially answered your question, I hope. No, no, that's very good. No, that's, that's that completely answers my question. Are those, I'll just, are those cells senescent, by the way? The dormant ones. Are they you know? sorry? Are they do they senesce or how do they arrest? Do you no, know? they're they're dormant and not senescent. 
Yeah, so if you look at their signaling profile, it looks like mammalian dormant cells. So both the um, signaling and gene expression profiles are very similar. So as always, Drosophila turns out to be a really good model for mammalian systems. Yeah. Thank you. But they're Thank not you. senescent. They're not senescent. You add back IU and they're boom, they're dry, they're growing again. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. We have another question, and um, this is from Anonymous. Um, so uh, the question is, over time, clones can lose their ability to express genes. Is this something you've noticed in all cell lines? And is there a recommended period of time of that cells should be used before thawing a fresh aliquot? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very good question. It's quite hard to regulate yourself because it's easier just to keep on using the lines than going back to frozen stock. I think it's really important to do, and, and maybe our colleagues at DGRC and Renata could say what he does. I mean, maybe five passages. We grew, and these, these cells grow to staggering numbers. I mean, hundreds of passages. And, you know, we had this G1 line at an early passage and then a much later passage, and, you know, they stopped twitching. So it's just enough to tell you either you know go back to earlier passages systematically or test them by some means to know whether they have changed and then go back but yeah it's good husbandry and i think it's something that you see in the mammalian um, research field where there's been a, a a big stir about rigor and reproducibility in cell lines so it really is good practice but i can't tell you an absolute number yeah Right. Um, yes, so there's the next question from um, Chun Han, and he was asking, um, can you comment on the difficulty of culturing these lines compared to S2? Um, yes. Um, I think I'd refer you to Gene Schneider's comments. You have to put in a bit of um, looking at these things. I mean, I don't think they're difficult to look at everyone in our lab has been able to propagate them. But if you're very used to using S2 cells, as I mentioned, they're very hard to kill. You have to use trypsin. These cells are adhering to the tissue culture flour, so you must use trypsin to dislodge them. And then we dilute them maybe about one in five. And then in about five to seven days, they'll be ready to passage again. There are no tricks. You just have to be cognizant of what the cells are doing. And when you know, you've know you gone too far, they'll start looking sort of ragged. And actually, as you trypsinize them, our trypsinizing solution has a pH. You can use a pH indicator in there. You'll see that they've really acidified the culture medium. And you know that's very unhealthy for cells. Some of these are really metabolically active. And they will, they will acidify the medium if you leave them too long. They, you know, essentially die. Yeah. Yes. I, I can't offer you shortcuts. I can only encourage you to, to look and learn. And, and of course, you're about to look after these cells. And um, was... so that I, I agree with Mandy um, in terms of handling those uh, lineage specific lines. It's really a matter of getting getting to know them a bit better first, because we tend to treat S2 lines as almost indestructible, but these guys, you may really need to um, just be familiar with them first to begin with. And things like morphology, uh, things like density, those are gonna be very important. There was a second part to that question. He was wanting to know um, if, for example, they grow in M3 media, what, what media are you using? And is there yeah. serum? Yep, so we grow them in Schneiders, which seems very disloyal to me now, but I know at the DGRC, they grow them in M3 medium. We have um, followed actually the lead from our DGRC colleagues and tapered off serum, so you can taper off serum. You know, for the, depending on the kind of experiments you, you do, we use 10% serum, we, we just keep the cells happy in that way, but you could, if you have a reason to, you could taper the serum for sure. So just one quick thing about that: those lines, um, the lineage specific lines we have not 
transition them to M3 media at the DGRC. We have kept it the same way, growing them in Schneider oh. media. Um, if we want, if we would like to change them to transition them to M3, I definitely do not suggest directly changing to M3, even though the compositions are roughly similar, but uh, a gradual change is what I would recommend over at least two to three passages. Okay, so we have a uh, next question from Justin Bosch. And his question is, um, what media do you use to isolate the tissue specific cell lines? And I suppose that is Shania's media. And then for cases where you had difficulty isolating tissue specific cell lines, did you test alternative media to see if this improves uh, the, 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 the chances of getting new lines? Yeah, no, I, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't think it would make the difference. I think it's something about the level of RAS expression or the specific cells. The MEF2, GAL4, I mean, you can derive primary cultures, but if you look at those primary cultures, the so this has GFP, so you can follow the lineage. The muscle, so the GFP positive cells in those cultures look very abnormal, they're sort of floating. So maybe MEF2 is just overkill RAS expression, and that's why you don't get a cell line. We haven't looked systematically at the failures because 24B is incredibly effective. And these are adult muscle precursors that have been targeted in the 24B line. So it, it worked so well that we didn't investigate further why MEF2 failed. But I doubt very much it would be the formulation of the medium. And Justin has a follow-up question. For the fly burgers, are there FDA regulations that will restrict people from eating meat that are genetically expressing breastfeed transfer? Yeah, good point. Don't tell any potential investors that they are GMOs. Yeah, I mean, of course, the amazing thing in mammalian systems that are different from vertebrate systems because well, actually in vertebrates there's shrimp and stuff that's going to be coming onto the market soon they have different ways of making these cells immortal maybe pet food i know that the biggest insect pet food factory is in france i mean that's insect farming but yes excellent point hey um steve rogers has one question have you tried combining cell lines that might interact in vivo? Say, for example, neurons and glia to recapture uh, heterogeneous interactions like a organoid. Yeah, excellent question. And probably should have been number three on my list. Yeah, very interested in attempting co-culture of various cell types to try and recapitulate more authentic biology in vitro, definitely. We have a couple more here. Um, Katie Ong, she's asking, um, for the tumor dormancy studies, it seems that after drug feeding, there's a GFP showing tumor cells throughout the body. But at a higher resolution, do you see the host tissue preference for where the tumor cells implant and proliferate? Mm, we haven't done that kind of study. So remember, flies, do you have an open blood system? So... Yeah, they're pretty much throughout. We did, when we originally reported the RAS method, we did look to see that these cells actually do infiltrate host tissues. I, I know nothing about whether there's a um, preferred cell type, but you know the tumor burden is such that just growing free in the abdominal cavity that's going to be enough to, to kill the host you can keep them dormant for very long periods of time and the flies live out a more or less normal life. And this question um, from Katie reminds me also of um, Bruno Lemaitre's um, recent work and showing how those cells when injected changes in expression pattern as well. Some of the rest lines, but not the lineage specific lines, but the early, earlier rest lines that they have injected into flies. Okay, so um, the next question from Ting Ting Su. Have you tried making cell lines from larvae? And do you plan to? Larvae. Um, you know, we, we, we did try pretty hard trying to make them from discs. 
but you mean you know choose well the thing about larval tissue so about body for example is that they undergo you know endo reduplication so you don't get proliferating cell types so in the ras cultures the fat cells become absolutely enormous and you can stain them you know with a lipid stain so i'm not sure what larval cell type you're thinking of but depending on how you know they um divide that would that would be a barrier we know for example that the blood cell line, if you add it disone, those cells appear to die. So we think they're probably a larval cell type. So in the presence of ectisone, those cells are actually lice. Yeah. Um, next in question fact, we have. Oh, yes, go ahead, Mandy. I'm just going to say that in our experience, early embryos are the best to use to initiate. I was interesting when I reread. Schneider's paper, these those were actually very advanced embryos that they used. But in terms of pure success rates, young embryos seem to be better. And I think you'll see that throughout the literature. When you say young, how young do you? Well, we do, do you know, we do two collections. So we do one through the day at sort of, you know, ambient and one overnight at a lower temperature. We don't waste any embryos. So we set up primary cultures from both types, you know, both time frames. And I think if we really look back at our data, those short collections are a bit more efficient, but, but either will work. Okay, um, we have one more question on uh, egg Dyson treatment. Um, okay, so the question comes from August Kanka. Uh, are these brief exposures that stimulate development of egg Dyson peaks, do they correspond with that? And are all the tissues derived cells responsive to egg Dyson? Yeah, so um, yes, we're mimicking what happens at the larval to adult transition. So two pulses of egg Dyson each for about a day, separated by a day. And it seems to be, you know, if, if you give those um, mesodermal cells one pulse of ectisone, they actually don't differentiate. So when we really mimic what happens in vivo, which of course you always should do, that we saw this dramatic change and activity. Do they all do something? Um, I just described one other type that actually dies. The epithelial cells have to pile up a bit more. I don't know if they're attempting to make some kind of 3D structure. Glial ones sort of form these lacy networks. Uh, neuronal ones look more neuronal. You'll see those pictures in our paper. Yeah, I would say they're all, all doing something, but nothing is sort of outstanding as those muscle ones that actually twitched for us. But yes, they, they do respond. We have one uh, question from Rebecca Lee, and she has a basic question, maybe not really basic, but uh, she's asking, could you go over the reasons why you might use M3 versus Midas Media? Because my old boss made it, um, but actually I don't use it, so I don't think I can do that. Um, we have, what have I seen, almost nothing in the difference between the two and we certainly have gone to and fro and as Arthur was describing you know you can taper them down into the other kind of medium I can't think of a reason why they're not more or less equivalent uh, we use Schneider's and now I hear DGRC for these cells use Schneider's but we have certainly grown them in M3 so I suppose you could choose the one you prefer I have nothing empirical on differences. In in at least in our experience, um, M three media can be different for from different companies. So, um, we tend to like to use Sigma M three, but um, given that it's currently in high levels of back order for a year now, um, we have tried tested other M threes as well, and so far, okay. Mm -hmm. I, that's an excellent point, Arthur, and we you know also instances of back orders desperately ordered from all other kinds of companies and honestly the medium was fairly toxic in some cases yeah. didn't quite force me to go back to weigh all the components 
but yes, I think that's probably settling on a company that you know the cells grow um, well in is more important than whether it's M3 or S2, Schneider's. Um, we have one more question, a follow-up question from Tin Tin Su. Uh, she is asking, is the expression of oncogenic rest, does it trigger uh, for tumor cells coming out dormancy in humans? Yes, there are RAS models of regulatable RAS that, yeah, you can, yes, the answer to that. Whether they've been looked at, uh, there, you know, there are not very many models of tumor dormancy in mammalian systems, and there isn't anything quite like this where you can really switch them to and fro from proliferating to dormant states. Uh, yeah, but certainly, you know, pancreatic cancers, which mainly involve RAS signaling, if you have a regulatable RAS, you can turn RAS off and some of the pathways that come on are the same ones that we see. Yes. We have uh, one more question here. Um, is there a general rule from Sandra Bernstein? Uh, is there a general rule as to whether lines represent larval or adult cells? Or are they a heterogeneous mix, even though they all yeah. come from embryos? Yeah, so I think, you know, ictisone is the acid test of that. So I would say the hemocyte cell line is a larval type because on the addition of ictisone, those cells appear to lice. Um, so I think most of the things and you know what you will get are really, yeah, most of them are adult cell types, or they're going to be ones that you know can divide by mitosis in culture. I, I would say most of us are probably adult cell types, but not always the case. But the ectisome test would let you know that. I think we don't have questions on the list now. Great. Um, any questions from anybody else? So the recording, um, the talk today will be recorded, and um, I'm going to edit everything and then have it as a link sometime midweek. I'm going to send it out as an uh, uh, email as well as putting it up on the DGRC website. So if any of your students or uh, colleagues that couldn't attend today, um, please direct them to this particular resource there. Um, there, was, there was a question earlier from Mandy about how often we will be doing this seminar series. And I think the goal is twice a year, so spring and fall. Um, and I know that we would welcome any uh, comments or thoughts on topics that you would like to hear or anyone you'd like to hear from. Um, our, our goal is to, you know, Lucy was very, very much um, hands on in teaching people. And I think this is the best way really to, to honor her is to continue what she started and, and continue teaching people. So if there are things that you would like to learn, um, please reach out to us and, and we'll work to help make those educational uh, things available to you, whether it's a, you know, part of the series or making um we're working on making some videos that will live on our website that help everyone out who wants to continue or to start using tissue culture work and if you feel you have something you want to share and you want to give one of these talks please contact us yes we have also prepared a short survey at the end of the seminar um and some of it will be sent out as email as well so we would appreciate any feedback or if you have any topics that uh you have in mind, just type it in, in the comment section as well in the survey. And then, um, well, let us thank Mandy one more time for sharing her generous insights and with all of us today. Thank you very much, Arthur.